Failure is easy. Failure is uh, convenient. I can quit if things don't go my way. I can throw in the towel. Um, I remember years ago, this is a long time ago, I was going through flight school, navigation school in the Air Force, and I had failed, uh, busted my first check ride. And to this point, I had passed everything with flying colors. I was doing well. There had been no problems. And at this point, uh, I failed my check ride. And it, I was ready to give up. I was ready to quit. I, I think success had spoiled me. Success does that sometimes to a success. It will spoil us. And uh, so God has to allow us to experience failure. And then that failure is going to determine or doesn't determine. It reveals to us our character, who we are. And at that point, I just wanted to quit. Fortunately, I had a roommate who was uh, two or three months ahead of me in the program. And he really challenged me. He took me out to eat that night. And he said, Todd, don't quit. You get back up. Get back on the horse. Um, go, go back, study, prepare for this ride again and uh, prepare for the evaluation, go in there and pass this thing. And I did just that. And I was able to pass the retake, the retest, the reflight, and uh, pass that check ride and moved on in the program and eventually graduated. That's the last time that I busted anything or failed a check ride or an evaluation. Taught me a valuable lesson, but I wanted to quit. I wanted to give up. Um, I, I, but resiliency, the ability to bounce back had to come in there. And I needed somebody to come along and encourage me to do that. Because again, it's so easy to quit. I, I had made plans in my mind of how I was now going to live life with this failure and what I was going to do in the Air Force outside of flying because of one setback that I thought was tragic. And when I look back on that, it was not tragic at all. There was nothing tragic. It was just a great learning experience. I would go on in the Air Force to have many other failures and many other setbacks, but only to learn that they were there to teach me something. So we have to develop an attitude of resiliency if we're going to succeed in life, to get back up, to bounce back up. That's what resiliency is. It's the ability to bounce back, to get back up uh, despite our failures, learn something from it, and push forward. That's what resiliency is. So if I had to pick a person who was probably the most what I would consider, me personally, Todd Robinson, what I would consider, who I would consider to be extremely resilient. There's so many people that we can pick from. Right? You know, resiliency is common amongst leader after leader after leader. And uh, that ability to bounce back from failure, that ability to bounce back from, from a setback. But for me, we could look across the spectrum. And if you look in my office here, um, and I'll stand up for a minute. I have, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to turn this or I'll pick it up here. You know, I, I have a lot of books in here on a lot of different people who, um, are resilient. They're just extremely resilient, but I'm going to walk around here because probably who I would pick me personally, Todd Robinson, a resilient person. I'm going to flip my, my camera around here and show you there's some books down here about Winston Churchill. And I would say for me personally, Winston Churchill is, excuse my hand there, Winston Churchill is one of the most resilient people in the history, in modern history in the last, obviously the 20th century. We're now in the 21st century. So certainly it, without Winston Churchill, I don't think that we live in the world that we live in today. Um, he, he was the catalyst behind winning World War II. Uh, certainly the United States and its leaders, especially its military leaders, but politically, politically, Winston Churchill was the greatest political leader of World War II. It, I don't believe it was Roosevelt. Um, I don't believe, uh, certainly not Stalin. Um, uh, but it was, uh, it was Winston Churchill and Winston Churchill rose from the ashes uh, the old mythological figure, the phoenix, you know, rises from the ashes. And Winston Churchill over and over and over again rose from the ashes. Political failures um, throughout his career. Um, uh, he was loved by the people, hated by the people, loved by the people, hated by the people. But he always rose above all the adversity. He rose above all his failures 
to ultimately lead the Great Britain and to lead the world in World War II against uh, Hitler um, and against the uh, the Axis forces. So my favorite figure of resiliency um, would be would be Winston Churchill. And certainly you have yours, and and we should imitate those. I remember I read several books years ago. Uh, a series of books on different leaders who were tremendously resilient. Abraham Lincoln, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Winston Churchill was was certainly one of those and a number of others as we read through those and just saw the resiliency of these great leaders. Um, and that's what it's going to take for us to to move forward in life, to to have an impact in life, to to. Uh, God wants us to make a mark in this world for Him, and if we're going to make that mark in this world for Him, if we're going to if we're going to win, and that and God wants us to win. First uh, Corinthians chapter nine is all about winning. Paul Paul reminds us that we're not here to lose; we're here to win. And if we're going to win, we got to be we got to be resilient. So, I hope you pick somebody in history, certainly in the Bible, and I I, I could. Uh, go on and on and on about the characters of the Bible. And I'm, when I say Winston Churchill, I'm talking about somebody outside of, of Scripture. Uh, but we should pick people that we look to, that we admire, that we can kind of gauge to at times when, we, when we're in those tough times. And uh, we can say, look, if, if they can do it, we can do it. So we have to be, we have to be resilient if we're going to make a mark and leave an impact in this world for God. So what do resilient people do? What, what are the people who bounce back in life, who come back from setbacks, who are able to succeed in life, make an impact for the Lord? What, what do these people do that helps them to come back from adversity, to come back from failure, to come back from things that seem to set most of us down, that keep us from, from getting ahead? There, it's the difference between people who are are really going someplace, and I don't mean uh, you know they're they're um, Elon Musk or they're Jeff Bezos, but they are man. No matter what happens to them, bad or good, they're making a difference. And so, who who are these people? What mindset do they have? And there's a couple of things that I've noticed about people who are resilient. First of all, um, resilient people practice resiliency in their life every day. What do I mean by that? Well, a lot of times we think about resilient people are people who, who bounce back from big, bad failures. Um, the loss of a business or the loss of a loved one, the loss of a home, um, you know, some big tragedy but really, resilient people every day, they practice resiliency in every part of their life. Um, they, they see everything as, um, uh, as, as every little part of their life is, is important to them. Every decision that they make is important to them. And so they're always practicing this idea of resiliency in their mind, even if it's minor, even if it's small. And I, I'm going to get back to that here in just a few minutes. Um, but but resilient people also have learned to deal with friction in their life. They've learned to deal. They understand that life is 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 a school. We are all in this school of life. Some of us go to uh, the school of medicine. Some of us go to the school of law. Some of us go to the school of uh, ministry. Uh, um, you name it. We there's all these different schools that people go to. Um, but we're all in the school of life. And they have taken on life as a constant learning environment. It's this, it's this incubator in which, in which learning takes place all the time. And, 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 they, and they go into the school of life and they fail some classes and then they get back up and they pass that class. And they might fail another class, they get back up and they're going to take it again and they're going to eventually pass that class. That's the thing about the school of life. A lot of times if you're in school, if you're in college, if you fail a class, oh, you failed that class and it's, you, you got to uh, take it over again. You got to pay the money to take it over again. Well, when you fail things in the school of life, the payment is you failed. Um, 
and, and, and you get back up and you do it again. Um, and, and, and so they get through friction. Um, people who have um, uh, get back up here, they, they, they are resilient people, understand that friction is okay. It's part of the school of life. And every single one of us is going through the school of life and we get to never graduate from the school of life, at least while we're alive. One day when we pass from this world into the presence of the Lord, we will leave here and we will graduate. Um, but until then, there's no graduation in the school of life. So we just have to face that. We have to face that we're, we're in this school of life. There's going to be friction. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be pain. There's going to be things that happen. And we have to deal with that. And we have to face it head on. We learn from it. We grow from it. We understand that though friction in life is correcting things that we need to correct. Pain in life, failure in life, um, we want everything to work. And the things that are working are working and we like those things. But the things that are failing, they're failing because we need to correct something. And so if we're going to be resilient, we need to correct those things. And, and so if we're going to be resilient here, we understand that there's going to be friction, there's going to be conflict, there's going to be pain, there's going to be suffering, there's going to be things we don't like, and that's okay. But what goes along with that is we tend to make excuses. We make these excuses as to why we can't get back up, why I can't try again, why I can't uh, make another effort to do what I just tried to do and I failed. And maybe I need to readjust some things. And maybe I need to take a different view. Or I need to get some advice on some things. I need to bring in a consultant or I need to get a coach or I need to get counseling or I need to go see my pastor or I need to go see my friends or who, whatever it is. Um, get back up, stop making excuses. And the reason that we always make excuses, I do it, you do it, we all do it. The reason we make excuses is because of fear. The reason we don't uh, ask the questions that we need to ask, we don't engage the people we need to engage. The reason that we don't go to the places we don't need that we need to go is because of fear. I, one of my favorite uh, um, marketing individuals um, is Seth Godin. And years ago, I decided that I wanted to write a book. And then I, the fears came in there. What if nobody reads it? What if nobody likes it? What if nobody cares? And I heard Seth Godin interviewing a guy one day. And, he, and this guy was talking to him. He said he wanted to write a book about his life. He grew up a very, very, very difficult life. Abusive parents. Um, and he came through that to be a very successful business person. And he said, Seth, I want to write a book about my life. He said, but my fear is that nobody will read it. And Seth said, you know what the reality is, is probably not a pot, lot of people will read it, but that's okay. Who are you writing the book for? You're writing the book for you. You're writing the book for the one or two or 10 or 20, however many people read it. If 10 people read it, you wrote it for those 10 people. If a million people read it, you wrote it for those million people. But whoever you write it for, you don't know, but write it anyway. And if you wrote it just for you, you've got to be okay with that. And I thought, wow, that's good advice. So I wrote that first book and um, um, I decided that I'm writing this just for me. And boy, writing that book caused me to grow, caused me to think. Um, I don't know how many people have bought my book. I, I don't know. I, I really, I, I don't keep track of that. I know several have and I get calls a lot uh, for people uh, asking me how they can get a hold of more copies or or. Uh, if I can sign them and different things like that, that's okay. It's nothing huge. I'm not a big author and, and that's okay. Um, so I wrote a second book and I said, you know what? Same thing here. And um, I've had people stop me different places and tell me, hey, I read your book. I read your book on Jonah. Wow, man, I really enjoyed that. It really helped me to grow. And if that person was the only person that I wrote that book for, that's okay. And I have to be okay with that. I had to learn to stop letting my fears get in the way and just do it. Just do it. So now I've started writing a third book. I'm writing a third book on pain. And I've just enjoyed writing this book. And I've learned so much. And I've, I've engaged in so many stories on, in, li in the lives of people who've been through tremendous amounts of pain. And you just write the book. And if nobody else reads it, nobody else reads it. If I'm the only one who writes it and reads it. I have to be okay with that. I have to be okay 
with, with that because it, it's for me. It, it's for my growth. And maybe one or two people will read it and and they'll and they'll enjoy it and they'll grow from it. But but that changed my whole perspective. That's what resilient people do. They just it. I'm not going to be concerned about what other people think. I'm not going to be concerned about what other people say. I'm not going to be concerned about what other people are doing, uh, or if they're opposing me, or if they're they're laughing at me. And that's okay. If if I'm the butt of your jokes, uh, great. I'm glad that I can I can entertain you. So those are just a couple of things when we're talking about resiliency. It's it, it, it's it's the, the the pain and the friction and the conflict, you know, that we experience that keep us back, that keep us from getting back up. And then it's it's the excuses which are based in fear. What are people going to think? What are people going to say? Um, what if nobody believes in me? Do you believe it? Nobody is going to believe in you if you don't believe in you. If you don't believe in yourself, nobody's going to believe in you. If you don't have, if you don't um, uh, exhibit some amount of confidence in what you're doing, then, then nobody else is going to believe in you either. And you have to know that if God's called you to do something, if you believe that God has called you to write a book, write it. Because it might just be for you. Just because, again, I'll go back to the book. Just because... Um, you feel believe that God has called you to do something like write a book. It, it might be just for you. It, it might be just for me. It, th just because you feel called to something doesn't mean that it's going to impact thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people. It might just be to impact you. So get back up and whatever you're not doing, do it. So I'm out here in my in my workshop. Uh, a lot of tools in here. It's a lot of mess in here right now. Um, and so as we continue on this idea of resiliency, um, the first thing that we just, or the last thing that we talked about was the idea that, you know, what keeps us from being resilient? A couple of things are, first of all, our fears, the, the, or the, the friction, we should say. The friction, the um, conflict, um, people keep me down. And then the second thing is uh, the fear, which leads to our excuses, right? So friction and fear, friction and excuses, friction and fear um, kind of keep us from getting back up and reinventing the wheel, getting back up and learning from our mistakes and pressing forward in that school of life that we never graduate from, at least while we're alive. Keep learning, keep growing. You have never arrived. You're never going to arrive while you're here on this, on this big round rock that we call Earth. So I wrote down some things that are kind of you need to have in your tool bag for resiliency. Now I take this, and I'm not going to read this passage to you, but I took these from Second Peter, chapter one, verses five through eight, and then uh, a few verses after that. And in that passage, Peter is telling us some things that we need to add to our faith in order to grow, because that's what we're doing in our resiliency is we're growing. We're growing resiliency. Resilient people are people who want to grow. They want to keep going forward. And so I, I have them on this little piece of paper right here. So I'm going to refer to that um, while we're while we're talking. And you can see my garage, which or my workshop, not my garage, that desperately needs cleaning it desperately does and now that the weather's getting better though it's cooled off a little bit here in march uh, i've got to get back out here and get this place cleaned up so i can at least get some productivity out of this place so the very first thing that that resilient people are the, the, is is that the they're diligent in other words diligent when i'm diligent about something it's important to me and if 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 you're not serious about things and if, if it's not important to you, you're not going to get back up. You're not going to you're not going to get back up. So we have to be diligent about seeking our growth, about seeking the things that God would have for us. We have to be diligent about those things. They have to be important to us. If things aren't important to you, you're not going to do that. You're not, you know, if something knocks you down and it's and you it, there's something you're trying to achieve, and you get knocked down in the process, if it's not that important to you, you're not going to get back up. And so sometimes when we fail to be resilient, it's because it just wasn't important to us. It, there's just, it really wasn't a priority for me. Maybe it's something I thought was neat that I should do. Um, but, uh, you know, 
There's so many things that I talk about doing that, uh, that I talk to my wife about doing. Hey, let's, I might want to try this. I might want to try that. But, that, but then I, I don't really follow through. And it's because it, it sounded neat. And it sounded like a good idea. But it just wasn't important to me. And so I, I didn't do it. Maybe one day it will be. One day maybe my priorities will change and it will be, it will be important to me. So the, the second thing is, is that uh, it's got, first it's gotta be, it's gotta be important to me. Second of all, um, in my life, if I'm going to be resilient, I've got to practice an attitude of excellence. Uh, not just excellence in what I want to accomplish, but moral excellence in my life. Um, I've got to lead a life of excellence um, in terms of what I'm trying to accomplish and how I live my life and who I hang out with and the things that I say and my behavior and all those things. So moral people, moral people who are pursuing moral excellence and excellence in their work are going to be resilient people because in pursuing that excellence, they're going to get back up. They're going to, they're going to rise back up. Because they realize that what they've been going through and maybe what they failed at is just a tool. It's just an avenue. It's a tool because we're in the we're in the we're in the workshop. It's a tool that they're going to use to help them achieve what they're trying to achieve. So moral excellence. So it's got to be important. There's got to be moral excellence in your life. Thirdly, there's got to be some understanding. You got to be gaining knowledge. There's got to be. Um, learning that's taking place, not just because of the failure, but there's got to be learning that's taking place because you're pursuing learning. You're, you're reading, you're studying, you're listening, you're getting advice on things. So you're getting understanding about the issue or whatever you're pursuing, but at the same time, you're also gaining understanding about yourself. You've got to be self-aware. There's got to be some knowledge of who you are. You've got to really do some self-examination of who you are um, what your weaknesses are, what your strengths are. I was talking to a guy earlier today about uh, some goals for his life. And the first thing I asked him, I said, uh, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And, and sometimes we struggle to answer those things. We know what they are. Well, you know, the typical answer I always get when I ask somebody that question, hey, what are your strengths? Well, you know, I don't really know. You do know. You're just afraid to say them. You feel like you're bragging. Or if I say, what are your weaknesses? Well, you know, I don't really, you know, you do know what your weaknesses are. Say them, say your weaknesses, say your strengths and be honest with yourself about those things. And we struggle sometimes to, to do that because we fail at self-examination and we've got to get good at self-examination. We've got to get good at self-awareness. Um, what am I struggling with? What am I good at? What am I bad at? And then get help in those areas. And resilient people do that. Thirdly, um, when I have an idea of self-awareness um, and knowledge of myself, I, then I can exert and practice self-control. A lot of times I can't practice self-control because I'm not aware of what I'm doing that's wrong. And I have to be self-aware. So self-control is going to be accompanied by, by self-awareness. And in that self-control, that's going to help me to practice that moral excellence. And that moral excellence coupled with self-control means I'm saying no to uh, fleshly desires that, that I may have that I know I've got to kill. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help me to say no to these appetites that I know I don't need um, that may be creeping in there. And when those appetites creep in there, it, it prevents me from being resilient because I'm going to give in to things I shouldn't be giving into that cause me to be weak. Um, and they cause me to make excuses and right back down that road of, uh, of, of not being resilient. Next, I've got to be patient. Woo! Resilient people are patient people. In, in, in getting back up and starting over, sometimes I'm, there's some waiting that's going to take place. Um, I may have to wait around for the right opportunity again. I may have to work to save money again. I may have to do jobs I don't want to do in order to save the money that I need to save. And so I've got to be patient. Sometimes I've got to wait on other people and their abilities and their time. And I have to be patient. And that's very, very difficult. I, I say the, the, the four letter word that we all hate in the Bible is W-A-I-T, wait. We all hate that word, but yet there's so much power in waiting. Waiting is a powerful tool. Next, how about humility? I need some humility. Resilient people are humble people. 
Um, they can admit, hey, I messed up, I failed, I didn't make it, that's okay. Um, I realize now that I've got to talk to somebody uh, who knows better than me and they're able to admit their weaknesses, they're able to admit their failures, they're able to admit the things that they've done wrong and then, and then just humbly accept those things, humbly admit those things. Um, so many people don't like to admit that they need help. They don't like to admit that they're wrong. I've got to be admit I'm wrong. It, the Bible says that, that God exalts humble people. He, he exalts those who will humble themselves. He can then lift them up. And so we resilient people, they're humble. They're humble people. They're very, very humble. And then finally, resilient people show respect towards other people. They, they have respect uh, towards um uh, those who are around them, um, even if they may disagree with them, they, they respect them. So a, uh, a, a resilient person is a humble person and is a respectful person. They demonstrate what the Bible would call brotherly kindness towards one another. And when we have good relationships with people, um, then we can be resilient because we need people to help to, 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 when we fall, when we, when we, when we fail, if we have good relationships with people, we have people who are be on our team to help us get back, get back up again. And then finally, the last thing that we have to have that the, that the Bible says we have to have for resilience is sacrifice. The Bible uses the word charity or love, and that's that sacrificial love that we have to demonstrate that God demonstrated toward, towards us. And when we're willing to sacrifice, when we're willing to sacrifice for, for others, when we're willing to sacrifice for the mission that God's called us to, when we're willing to sacrifice um, and, and, and give everything we have to what we're called to, um, if you're not called to it, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be resilient. We, we, there's gotta be a calling in your life and when there's that calling, we're, 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 we're sacrificing. So what are those things? Let's, let's recap that, right? So if we're going to be resilient, it's got to be important to me. If we're going to be resilient, there's got to be moral excellence in my life. If I'm going to be resilient, there's got to be a knowledge and understanding and self-awareness. What's my purpose here? Why am I doing this? There's got to be some self-control. There's got to be some mastery of those desires and those appetites that we should not be entertaining. There's got to be some mastery around those things. There's got to be patience. We've got to be unmovable in the mission. Are you unmovable in the mission? Unmovable people are resilient people. And there's got to be some humility, some godliness in there. Then there's got to be some respect, some brotherly kindness towards others. And finally, there's got to be sacrificial love, charity. There's got to be a giving over of yourself to others for the mission that we've been called to. And then we'll be resilient. That's what resilient people are, according to the word of God. Isn't that amazing? So I challenge you today, go out back and read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. And then when you get to uh, the verses after that, God will give you the the, um, the result of, of not practicing these things. He says, we become blind and when we become blind. We fall and we don't get back up a lot of times. So practice these things, practice, put these things into practice in your life. And when you do that, you're practicing resiliency day in and day out in the little things you're practicing resiliency in the little things. So when the big things happen that we truly need to be resilient around, We've already been doing it day in and day out in our lives.